So for today, what I want to do is introduce um, Dr. Jordan Yaron, who I had the pleasure of meeting, um, sadly, through his late grandfather, who is, and that's when I met his family, a really great family. Um, and I also learned a little bit about Dr. Yaron, not in his professional field, but as a grandchild, so I really uh, loved his grandfather and was devoted to him. So that is more about a person than any of their research, in my opinion. Uh, so I'm, it, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jordan Yaron, who works for, is an asso is a assistant research professor at the ASU uh, Bio Design Institute. And I'm going to let him give a little bit more information about himself. Uh, what I will do is I'm going to mute everyone like we've done in the past. If you have any questions during the presentation, please do uh, write it in the chat. At the end of the presentation, uh, when the Q&A can be a little bit more open, we can uh, allow you to unmute yourself uh, to ask those questions. So let me unmute Dr. Yaron and we can begin with uh, Dr. Yaron. So again, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us and the mic is yours. Thanks, thank you for the introduction, Rabbi Levy. Uh, you know, it's always a pleasure meeting with you even uh, under unusual circumstances, so. Uh, hopefully today will be just all about information. Um, so Rabbi Levy, uh, and thank you everyone for, for attending uh, or, or Zooming in, I guess. Um, so uh, Rabbi Levy contacted me and said, do you know anyone who's working on coronavirus? I'd like to have someone come and talk to the group. And I said, well, yeah, we have a lot of experts, but uh, you know, everyone's really busy right now. And I, you know, some coronavirus too, I could talk. It and I'm happy to give um, some some insight in, into what's going on. And he said, "Yeah, well, that's that's a great topic. Uh, let's do it." Um, so I am uh, an assistant research professor at, at ASU. I've uh, I have a PhD in molecular biology. I did a two-year postdoc at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, uh, and then another three years of postdoc at ASU before recently being appointed uh, an assistant research professor. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about my specific research later, um, but I just wanted to begin with sort of the, the topic of the day, right, is coronavirus. So I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, I have a little presentation. I think you can see it. Yeah, we see it now. Okay. So... <clears throat> I titled it Coronavirus is Where Are We Now and Where Are We Going? Because I think uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of media around this topic. And uh, as media tend to do, um, because not everybody is an expert in the specific topic of coronavirus biology and virus biology, there's some simplifications. And simplifications can often lead to misunderstanding. So I thought it would be helpful um, to just go through from the very beginning uh, and talk about some of the basics of what's going on, because I think if you understand it at the most simple level, you can understand it uh, as it applies to your life. So the first question we need to ask is, what is a coronavirus? I'm sure everybody has seen the picture on the left of this three-dimensional sort of fancy looking object. This is not an actual picture. This is uh, an artist's rendition of what a coronavirus probably looks like. Now, the picture on the right is the best picture of an actual coronavirus that we have. So this is taken with a very special type of microscope called an electron microscope. Uh, the original image is black and white. So this was colored to give some sense of uh, object identity. And so you can see here why the artist's rendition looks the way it does because the real virus particles that you see on the, on the right has these little spikes sticking off of it and it sort of looks like a crown. And so that's where the name coronavirus came from. These are very, very small. Uh, they're about, if you took one of your hairs and you look down the end of the hair and you know it's a very, very small diameter, but if you cut that in half, 10,000 times, that's about the size of a single coronavirus. So when you have it in your body, 
hopefully none of us do, and hopefully none of us will, but there's, there's many, many millions and billions of them. Um, it's, it's, it's a very, very small thing, and it obviously causes a lot of damage, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So we, we know that this is generally what the coronavirus looks like, but what is, what's actually going on there? Coronaviruses are, it may seem silly to say, they're really simple machines. Okay, so really all the coronavirus is, it's like a, a, it's a little bubble of fat. You can almost think of it like uh, a, a bubble of soap. And inside that bubble is the DNA or the RNA, the, the genetic uh, information for coronavirus, it's RNA, the genetic information of the virus. And then along the outside of the bubble are little um, spikes, which it uses to get into a cell. But a virus is, is nothing on its own. If a virus were just sitting on the surface of a desk, it would do nothing. It would sit there until it decays and then it's gone forever. A virus absolutely requires a, a host, a, a human, a dog, a cat, or a rabbit, something like that to, to be functional. On its own, it's nothing. When I say those simple programs, I really mean they're, they're, they're simple in the context of the biology we know. So if we took all the letters of the genome of a coronavirus, there's only 32,000 letters. That may seem like a lot, but if you compare that to the human genome, which is 6.4 billion letters with a B, you can get a sense of the scale here. These are tiny, tiny, tiny little machines that really only have instructions to do a couple of things. You know, humans have so many different organs, we have livers and brains and kidneys, and we have to have the information to do all that stuff, all that function. A virus needs to be able to do just one thing, and that's make more of itself. So this is how a, cor a coronavirus works. So we have on the outside of all the cells in our body, little, we call them receptors, they're little proteins, they sort of act like a, a, a keyhole. And when a uh, a key gets into that hole, it, it changes our cells and it causes a response. And so sometimes it causes us, our cells to sort of take things in, right? So to open the door and allow things inside of our cells. So coronaviruses have this spike protein that sits on the outside of the virus. And when that protein interacts with the receptor on our cells, on human cells, it triggers our cells to take up the virus actively. So the virus isn't actually forcing itself into the cells. It's, it's tricking our cells to say, hey, this is something I want inside of me. And so as soon as the virus interacts with that receptor, our own cells are welcoming this virus in. And as soon as it gets inside of our cells, it breaks out of its little bubble and it releases all of, all of the machinery that it brought with it, okay? So the main pieces that it releases are the RNA genome, which are the instructions for making more virus, and one or two simple machines that allow it to interact with our own machinery. And that's where coronaviruses are really tricky because most of the work being done to make more virus is being done by our own bodies. The virus isn't doing it itself. It's, it's commandeering, it's taking control of our own cells and it's, tricking it into saying, make more, make more of me, make more virus. And so it starts making a ton of genome. It starts making ton, a ton of protein to package more virus. And then it releases from those cells. And then it goes onto the next cell and it does it over and over and over again until it spreads throughout uh, our, our bodies. So this receptor that the virus uses to get in are only found on a couple of different areas in the body. So they're found in our airways, in our, our nasal passages, in our trachea, and our lungs, and they're found in our gastrointestinal tract. So if you got a virus on your skin, it would not be dangerous because the virus can't get into the skin. It can't do anything there because the, the hole that the virus is looking for to, to trick, to put the key in and trick the cells into taking it up doesn't exist on our skin. It doesn't exist on, on um, a lot of our mouth. Um, so there, it really needs to get into something like our airways. So that's why masks are very helpful because it can protect against the virus from getting into the part of our body where it can actually trick the cells into taking the virus in. 
So there's a little bit of confusion I see in, in a lot of the news talking about what the virus is doing. The virus does a little bit of damage on its own. That's true. Um, when it gets into cells and it's replicating and it makes a lot of itself, it can sort of overwhelm the cells and to the point where it bursts open, okay? But that's not actually the main cause of the damage that is happening in the lungs of patients suffering from, from COVID-19, the current coronavirus. So a lot of what happens is when a little bit of this damage occurs or when a, a little bit of the virus is detected by the immune system, our own protective immune system attacks so strongly that it damages areas around where the virus is replicating. So instead of going in and specifically looking at that one virus and taking out that one virus, it drops a bomb on the lungs, trying to do anything it can to shut down the virus. And unfortunately that can cause a huge amount of damage into cells which may not be infected at all. It, we, we, our own immune system is attacking our own body in an effort to take care of this virus. So what you end up seeing in images like this, so this is a patient uh, obviously suffering from COVID-19. And you, you've probably seen images like this on the news before where you get these things called ground glass opacities uh, in the lungs, these white highlighted areas in the lungs. So that's not virus that's happening there. What, what you're actually seeing is physical damage to the lungs, filling of blood and other fluids that, that is primarily caused by our own immune system having too strong of a response directly in the lungs. So the virus is probably doing a very small amount of this damage and the rest of it is what we call an immunopathology. So the immune system is causing the danger. So here's some data uh, from a group that, it's not through peer review yet, but it is made public. So this is data from a monkey that was infected with the current coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. And so you see here the brown is the area of the lungs that is infected with the coronavirus. All the little blue is just indicating the monkey cells and the brown are monkey cells that are infected with the coronavirus. These monkeys exhibited disease as if they had COVID-19, similar disease to what humans would experience. But you can see that there's actually very little of the lung that's actively infected by this virus. It's a pretty small amount. And despite this, those monkeys were experiencing this severe, severe disease. And this isn't the first time we've seen something like this before. Our immune system does this with other infections. So this is what it actually looks like for something like uh, the, the bacteria that causes the plague, okay? So the video will play over and over again. The green cells are cells of the immune system. And the little white fibers that you see are actually bacteria. And so what's happening is as soon as these uh, white blood cells detect that this bacteria is so dangerous, the, the green cells voluntarily explode. It's a very violent process at, at the biological level. And what ends up happening is it rings an alarm bell to the rest of the immune system to say, there's something dangerous going on here. We need support. And so as soon as those green cells burst, they release a bunch of message that goes into the bloodstream and it spreads throughout the body and the immune system knows, okay, there's, there's an area where there's some sort of active infection going on, some sort of active danger. We need to go in and try to fix it. So this is what happens as well with this coronavirus. The immune system goes in, it sees what's going on. Holy moly, there's something really dangerous. We need to get more help. And that causes a very violent response in the lungs. And I'll talk more about how that's going to try to be uh, approached in the current coronavirus for treatment. So there's another question of, well, I've heard I've had coronavirus before in my life, so why is this coronavirus so dangerous? So here's a, we call these uh, trees because they look like trees, phylogenetic trees. What I'm showing on the left are all of the different branches of coronavirus. So the end of every branch, the end of every blue line is a different coronavirus, and this is showing how they're related to each other. So coronaviruses are a family, okay? All the red coronaviruses that you see, there's, there's a lot of black, but there's a couple of red coronaviruses, HCoV-229E, NL63, and so on. Those are the coronaviruses which we know cause disease in humans, okay? So 
while there are many, many coronaviruses out there, they're not all dangerous to humans. And there are four coronaviruses, which most of us have experienced many times in our lives. So these ones that are called HCoV OC43, HCoV HKU1, and then the 229E and NL63, those are the viruses that cause most of the seasonal cold, not flu, cold. And those are symptomatically similar, but they're different types of infection. So if you don't, if you, if you, ever felt really sick before, like I think I have the flu and you go to the doctor and they do a flu test, but it comes up negative. It's very likely that that disease you were having was caused by a coronavirus. And our immune system does a pretty good job of clearing it without causing this super severe disease. But there are now three coronaviruses, which for reasons that biology is still trying to understand, uh, SARS, uh, another one called MERS, and then the current coronaviruses, which is called SARS-2, for some reason, those coronaviruses cause such a severe response in our immune system that we end up getting this dramatic disease, damage in the lungs, and high levels of, of mortality. Here on the right, I'm showing a, a tree uh, in a similar way, uh, excuse me, showing the different organisms that all these different coronaviruses can infect. And you see bats are commonly represented. So bats have a very weird immune system. They can take a lot of different viruses without getting sick. We're still trying to understand why, because maybe we can use that information to make our own immune systems more tolerant. But you see here that most coronaviruses are infecting animals, not humans, except for a couple. So how dangerous is COVID-19 actually? You hear a lot of comparison to flu. Uh, we all remember SARS uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, there's a, another one called MERS that I mentioned before, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. So this chart is comparing <clears throat> a lot of different factors of, across these different diseases. Uh, the, probably the two most important ones to compare are flu and COVID-19 because we're all so familiar with flu. So I'm just going to go through a couple of different factors here. The first one is R0 or R0. That's how many different people will get infected if an individual is infected. How many people will they spread it to? So for flu, it's, it's just over one other person. For COVID-19, it's two or three other people. So already we can say COVID-19 can spread faster. Now, normally that wouldn't be much of an issue, but there's this other factor here called the incubation time. If somebody has the flu and you get it from them, you'll feel it very quickly. One or two days, you'll start feeling sick. The tricky part about COVID-19 is if you get exposed to somebody with COVID-19 or somebody gets exposed to somebody with COVID-19, they can feel fine for a week, for two weeks. And during that time, even though they feel fine, they're spreading it. So that's why this specific virus became so spread around the world is because many people didn't know they had it. And while they didn't know they had it, they were spreading it. It was very unique to this virus. It's one of the longest incubation times for a virus that's ever been observed. Uh, in terms of fatality rate, the flu we know kills many, many people every year. But if we actually look at the real statistics, it kills less than 0.1% of people who get it. For COVID-19, it kills almost 30 times that. It's 30 times more deadly than the flu. And so when this infection was first starting, a lot of people were saying, well, flu kills so many people every year, but we don't shut down the economy. We don't shut down our whole country for the flu every year. That's true, we don't, but we never experienced COVID-19 before. And so the numbers were, we never, we don't know what to expect. We don't know what the upper limit is. This is the first time as a, as a global society, humans have ever, ever experienced this virus. So once the numbers started coming in to show that it is so much more deadly than the flu, that's when we started seeing these responses, including whole economies being shut down, uh, people being told to stay at home, because we don't know how bad it can actually get. And when we look at the numbers, the annual infected for the flu is about a billion. It's, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. We're at almost three and a half million for COVID-19. Now think about the fact that that's the flu over an entire year and it's COVID-19 over about three months. Uh, the annual infected is, is uh, you know, 
ongoing right now for COVID-19, but it's looking like it's going to be within an order of magnitude for the flu. And the annual deaths is already greater for COVID-19 than it is for the flu. So what can be done? What, what options do we have? You know, this is a scary time. Everyone's at home. What options are there? For the normal person, it's obviously, you know, stay away from people who are sick, wash your hands, wear a mask, um, you know, stay healthy in terms of your nutrition and sleeping and things like that. Don't go into risky situations if you don't need to be. Uh, and then there's the stuff that the scientific community is doing. So there's a huge push right now all around the world to find something, some sort of treatment, some sort of drug, which will make this all better. And so there is a giant push to look through all of the tens of thousands of, of known drugs and the millions of potential drugs, which we know are safe, and to, to just try it out. Because we don't know so enough about this coronavirus to know exactly what will work or what won't work. So let's just try everything. So a lot of this is being done by com computer simulation. Uh, and then a smaller amount of drugs are being tested in the lab to try all of these different parts of this virus life cycle that I mentioned before, preventing the virus from triggering this receptor and allowing the cell to take up the virus, preventing the virus from leaving its packaging, preventing the virus from replicating itself. All of these different parts of the life cycle of the virus are areas where science, scientists can say, well, maybe we can stop that part of the infection and that will make things better. Uh, so I wanna talk for a minute about a drug that many of us have heard on the news called hydroxychloroquine. Uh, so hydroxychloroquine was obviously thought to be uh, a really nice idea starting out. There were some early indications that maybe it would work. As the numbers started coming in, it started looking less and less like uh, the protective effect of hydroxychloroquine was real. A lot of the early clinical trials that came out from smaller groups, um, they, they came under a lot of scrutiny because only patients which were not severely infected were given the drug. And so they may have been able to recover without it. Uh, whereas the ones that we really care about knowing if they would do better would be the ones that were severely infected, severely diseased. Those are the ones that, that properly need the help. Um, so the FDA came out with a caution. So it's not forbidding it. Doctors can still prescribe it if they think in the practice of medicine that it may help a patient. But the FDA cautioned against the use of hydroxychloroquine or its other form called chloroquine, uh, especially outside of the hospital setting, because these drugs are dangerous on themselves. They can cause uh, sudden heart changes, which can cause what we call sudden cardiac arrest, uh, which is dangerous on its own, but compounding with the fact that the virus can also cause heart changes, it makes it a very delicate situation. So every individual patient, um, you know, at first everyone was saying, we need to get a lot of hydroxychloroquine and we need to all start taking it right now. Uh, there have already been people who have died because they took it thinking that they were protecting themselves. So uh, really this is now being cautioned against. It's not being forbidden. Um, it was thought that chloroquine would maybe stop uh, the virus from being taken up or coming out of its shell while it's inside the cell. And this is fine when you look at it in the laboratory. It, it does work this way when you look, you know, in a petri dish sort of situation. But, you know, when we look at stuff in the lab on a, in a dish, on a plate, that there's no heart there. There's no circulation there. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with a drug. You know, we, we can treat many different diseases, diseases in the lab, but once you start getting it into a human or a, a different type of animal like a monkey, you can see these dangerous effects. And that started coming out with hydroxychloroquine. So it was cautioned against. Yesterday, uh, I believe it was yesterday, uh, Anthony Fauci came out with early news of a clinical trial again, uh, using a drug called remdesivir. So this is a drug that was um, very popular in the early, early days in China as a potential drug. And then it sort of dropped off the map. Uh, and, and excitingly, it's, it's coming out as a potential drug uh, in this clinical trial that Dr. Fauci mentioned. Uh, this drug is, is very, very safe in humans, which is nice because it doesn't give us the same fear that hydroxy hydroxychloroquine does. Uh, the way it works is it tricks the machinery that the virus brings with itself, so it's not our own machinery. It tricks the machinery that the virus brings into breaking. So it's, it, it is sort of a, 
fake version, uh, a mimic version of something that the virus would use to replicate itself. And so when it gets in, inside the machinery of that virus, it breaks that machinery. This is a really safe way to do this because that machinery that this drug is breaking doesn't exist in our healthy human cells. So that's why there's a lot less side effects, there's a lot less risk in going forward with this drug. Um, obviously, the numbers need to be tested in the clinic. The, this clinical trial that's gonna be coming out has over a thousand patients. But when we're talking about a million patients worldwide, we need to be sure that the numbers are real. Um, so this is gonna go through peer review and a lot of other sort of um, uh, clinical trial testing, but this is likely to become the standard of care for patients that are going in because it's already FDA approved and they're, it's not difficult to make a lot of it, which is a good thing. Another thing that's being announced, this was just announced yesterday. Uh, so one of the things that happens when the immune system reacts very strongly is something that we call a cytokine storm. So this uh, is a very inflammatory event. It causes uh, sudden blood pressure changes in an effort to prevent infections from spreading throughout the body and on its own can cause death. So one of the things that's being thought of uh, as a, a way to supplement treatment and to prevent this dangerous cytokine storm is to actually target those chemicals that cause that inflammatory response. So uh, there were early trials against uh, one of those chemicals called interleukin-6, IL-6, they failed in clinical trial for COVID. Uh, every type of cytokine storm is different. And the one that is probably the most dangerous is one called, caused by a different protein called interleukin-1 or IL-1. Uh, Novartis announced yesterday a trial for COVID patients with their FDA-approved drug that blocks IL-1. Um, this is actually a very exciting announcement. I've been wondering why they didn't do this since January. So I'm eagerly awaiting the results of these clinical trials because this drug is actually a really remarkable thing. And then you've heard a lot about vaccines. So there's probably over a hundred labs around the world currently trying to develop vaccines uh, for, for COVID. Um, one of the challenges with coronavirus is something we call uh, an immune response, a neutralizing immune response. So if you imagine what an antibody does when you get vaccinated is it recognizes um, uh, an important part of whatever the dangerous thing is, an important part of the virus, and it shuts down or blocks that part of the virus. But antibodies can be generated and not be protective as well. If you imagine like a car and getting a boot on the tire of the car, if you put the boot on the rear view mirror, it's obviously not going to do anything. But if you put the boot on the tire, it would. So what we want to make sure is that the immune response that these uh, vaccines are generating makes sure to put the boot on the tire to prevent the virus from infecting. Um, so these are all the different ways uh, using different parts of the virus to sort of um, let the immune system know, hey, this is what the virus looks like. So when you see it next, respond to it. Uh, ASU has an effort right now using a, an approach called a recombinant viral vector. So it's using a safe virus to deliver pieces of the dangerous virus. So those pieces themselves won't cause disease, but it is a way to get the immune system to recognize these pieces of the dangerous virus very quickly. And so uh, Brenda Hogue, Bert Jacobs, and Grant McFadden are all working. These are uh, world-renowned, extremely famous, and extremely successful uh, virologists. Brenda is a world-renowned expert specifically in coronaviruses. Uh, Bert and Grant are experts on pox viruses, so that's the system they're using to deliver the, the protein. Um, and they're getting into rabbits, I believe, this week. So they've made a lot of headway, they've been working around the clock, and they're going to try it out very soon. Um, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. Just very briefly, I, I kind of want to talk about what our lab is doing. And so what we do uh, is we Imagine what happens when a virus is infecting the host, uh, which is then going to cause an immune response, uh, which will then shut down a virus in a normal situation. Uh, viruses have a way of creating proteins called immune modulators, which shut down that part of the immune system. Uh, if an immune system disease and an immune-driven disease acts on the host itself, so what, what I was saying before about the lungs, being damaged actually by the immune response and not by the viral response, it's the same machinery, we sort of look at those immune modulators that the virus creates as if they were therapeutics. So 
if the immune system is causing all this damage in the lungs, well, why don't we just take proteins, which we know are very good at calming the immune system down and give those to try to prevent this damage from occurring. So the, the proteins we get are from a, a virus that infects rabbits. It's totally safe in humans. It has, there's never been a single human infection of this virus, uh, and it is very broadly around. It only infects rabbits. Uh, but the proteins that the virus makes are very, very good drugs. So we're working with a protein called SERP1. Uh, we are the leading lab in the world in doing this sort of research, taking proteins from viruses and using them to treat disease. So the stuff that I've uh, shown here are all the different types of proteins that viruses make, and then all the different diseases which have been shown to be treatable with these proteins. So brain trauma, uh, um, cardiac transplant rejection, arthritis, hepatitis, everything in blue is work out of our lab. So we have a lot of work in this space. We've done many, many different types of diseases and we've seen a lot of efficacy. Um, the, our main protein that we work with is called a serpin. So you can kind of think of a serpin like a mouse trap. So if we look at this uh, blue protein, that is a protein that can cause damage. The pink part of this other protein is sort of the arm of the mouse trap. And when the blue protein interacts with this pink part of the protein, they stick together and that pink part of the protein swings all the way down and inserts itself into this yellow part of the protein. They get locked together permanently. And so all of these damaging proteins, which would go around and causing injury, are then completely neutralized, like sucked up with a sponge, and they can't cause damage. And so this is an actual picture of, of uh, it's, a, it's an actual representation of the protein we work with. So uh, we discovered the structure of the protein a couple of years ago. And what I'm showing on the right is data from a clinical trial with this protein. So this is the first ever protein the FDA ever allowed injected into humans that came from a virus. It's our protein. Uh, so patients that had a mini heart attack went into the hospital to get a stent implanted and they either got the normal standard of care or the standard of care plus our protein. And with increasing amounts of our protein, there were reduced markers of heart damage and no adverse events. So our protein is remarkably safe in humans. It uh, doesn't cause any uh, negative immune response and it very effectively at very, very, very low doses reduces inflammatory responses from the immune system, prevents damage. So we think that this will be a nice way maybe to treat a lot of the stuff that's happening with the coronavirus. <clears throat> so uh, Alex Lucas is a, a cardiologist I work with. Um, she was my postdoc advisor and now we're uh, colleagues. Uh, Brenda Hogue is the coronavirus expert I mentioned. Uh, SERP1 uh, interacts with a protein which is not commonly discussed uh, in coronavirus, uh, which it uses to turn the key of that lock that I mentioned before. And so the virus itself can stick the key into the lock on the cells, but it can't turn it on its own. It requires another protein, which our own cells provide to turn that lock and allow the virus to get taken up. So our protein uh, is, is a very likely candidate to uh, stop that event from happening. We're currently testing it. The data hasn't come in yet, but um, we're currently testing it in the lab to see if that works. And then we're gonna try to get into an animal system soon. Another thing that our protein is known to do uh, is it prevents inflammatory injury to the lungs. So if we look at what a healthy lung would look like under a microscope, it looks something like this. You see all that empty space. So that's how our lungs can expand because it can fill up all those little pockets with air. In an infection like, a, like SARS here, which is the same type of infection that's happening right now, there's so much inflammation happening in the lungs that all that open airway space gets closed off and you can't expand the lungs very much. That's why patients have to go on vent uh, uh, ventilators, excuse me. So we know that this works very well in other virus infections. So we have another model in the lab that we use uh, where we get a similar disease in mice. And so we see all of this inflammation and closing off of the airways in the lungs of these mice. And when we give our protein, SERP1, that air, those airways open up, the inflammation is shut down. And so we think that this will be a sort of um, two-pronged approach where we can potentially prevent the coronavirus from getting in and prevent the immune system from overreacting to this infection. 
again, we're testing this right now and hopefully the results will, will come in quick. Uh, so this is our group. Uh, so we call it the Alex Lucas Lab. Um, so Li Chang is a research scientist. Chuyun Guo is a visiting scholar who's actually from Wuhan, the, the epicenter of the, the original infection. Uh, she's been with us from well before the virus infection started, but she's a very talented scientist. And then here's our students and collaborators. And then I just want to briefly mention that we've had so much interest around our protein um, that a company formed around us. So we're going to try to get into clinical trials more quickly. We call it Surpass Biologics, and, and we're talking with um, federal agencies right now to sort of fast track funding to try to get some of our work into the clinic for the current event. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions about anything I talked about or any other questions you might have about the current uh, events. So thank you. Dr. Yaron, I was wondering how long have you been at Biodesign? That's a long story. So I did my PhD at Biodesign actually um, from 2010 until 2015. And then I went to Mayo Clinic for a, around two years doing my first uh, postdoctoral training. And then I came back to Biodesign in 2017. So in total, I've been there, uh, what would that be? Eight or nine years. Yeah. Oh, which center do you work for? So I currently work in the Virginia G. Piper Center for Personalized Diagnostics. Okay. I used to work in CIDV for Roy. Oh, great. When uh, Roy was there. Roy was there, yeah. 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 Of course, yeah. I was, he, he was still there while I was a grad student, so I remember him well. And right. Yes, you would remember him, quite the character. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I always heard that wearing a mask will not prevent you from getting the disease, but will prevent you from spreading it to others. Mm -hmm. So right. if everybody wears a mask, nobody can spread it, but it isn't gonna protect you per se. There is some truth in that. It is still possible to get infected if you wear a mask and somebody is actively coughing or spreading virus in the air around you because the virus can get into uh, the mucous membranes in your eye. So that same sort of keyhole that the virus uses also exists in, in those, um, the soft areas around our eyes. That's the big danger there. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that there's not any protection provided by a mask. It is, while it's still possible to get infected, there's something like a 50% reduction of uh, risk if you wear one of those standard surgical masks that fit loosely over the face and up to a 90% protection if you wear uh, an N95 respirator that fits correctly. Um, so there is definitely uh, some protective effect of wearing a mask. And this is from peer reviewed papers that have come out recently with the current virus infection. The, a lot of the, the argument there is that, well, you can still get infected, so why wear it at all? Personally, I'd prefer 50% protection to 0% protection. I agree. I have a question to follow up to that. If you uh, if you walk with somebody, I take hour long walks in the evenings. If mm -hmm. you walk with somebody and you're trying to stay six feet apart, but maybe you're not, mm -hmm. should you, and you're talking, mm -hmm. should you be each wearing a mask? I think it's right now, never an overreaction to wear a mask. Um, you know, I visit my mom a couple days a week and we take walks around her neighborhood and we're both wearing masks even with distance between us. Um, I just think that it's, it's the sort of thing where you'll never know what was an overreaction, but you'll always know what was an underreaction, right? So I, I don't think it's an, I don't think that you can be too safe. Thank you. Yeah. And just, um, I read various things. Can you wash the mask hand by hand instead of the machine right. and dry it in a dryer and then it's okay versus machine, washing right. machine and drying it? Right, so it, it depends on the type of mask. Um, some people are making homemade cloth masks. That's what I have. Um, right, so those you can treat just like any other cloth thing uh, and wash however you prefer because the, the soap that you use when you wash um, those masks, the soap, breaks apart the virus. If there was, let's say, virus that got stuck, if you happen to be exposed to it and the virus got stuck to the mask, 
um, that little bubble that I mentioned is actually made of fat. And just like anything else that has fat, you know, oils, soap will break it apart and destroy it. So it is considered a sterilization procedure. Um, cloth masks are um, not perfectly protective, but they certainly offer protection of some sort. Um, it's better than nothing, definitely. So it's uh, okay to hand wash it and then put it in the dryer on the high heat? Yeah, I mean, you want to be careful about letting things get thin, right? Like if you if you overwash and over dry any cloth thing, it'll get really thin. And so that'll have an effect on the structural integrity of the mask. So, um, you know, I think you should definitely clean it. <laughs> uh, it's always a good idea. And I, I don't see any difference between hand washing it or machine washing it. Just from okay. the for just from the idea of what that soap is going to be doing to the membrane of the virus. And if you air dry it in the sun, is that kill it as well versus the machine? Definitely UV exposure um, does break down the virus. Um, it, it messes with that genetic information that I mentioned. Um, so I don't see any negative effect to, to, air, to air drying it outside. So it's it's okay as opposed to in the machine a dryer. Yeah, I I, I think either one is equivalent. I don't think it's okay. one is better than the other. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Of course. Um, I see a question that I'm one. There's two questions I see. One of them maybe you'll address. The other one it looks like it's more for me. But <laughs> you can try. You can answer it. It was about the uh, Orthodox friend. <laughs> right. I'll defer to the expert. All right, but I'll answer that afterwards. I see there's, I do a lot of international travel. Do you think a trip to India in October is a possibility? That was uh, for you. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, just like uh, what happened after 9-11, a lot of our normal life is going to be changed. So I remember being able to go to the gate when I was dropping off family members when I was younger at the airport, which certainly doesn't happen now. I think once travel starts up again in larger numbers, there will be a lot more restriction on what will be allowed in terms of wearing masks or not wearing masks. Um, and I think that that's gonna be a data-driven decision process. So we already know that things are starting to open up again uh, around the world. And I think probably travel is gonna be one of those things that will probably be a lot more common later in the year around October. I think it's got to be a data-driven process. Um, certainly, it's a possibility. You can travel now, but it's always best to stay safe, you know, wearing the right types of masks. Hopefully, N95s will be more available then. I would wear N95s if you can get a hold of them because they're better. Um, washing hands, not touching your face. That's a discipline thing that a lot of people are finding is difficult right now is not touching your face. You know, being in the lab for the last 10 years, I'm very used to not touching my face because I've got chemicals and stuff on my hands. And I talked to my mom and she goes, I don't even realize I'm doing it. I'm just always, you know, I've got a scratch, I touch it. I'm not even aware. So that's gonna be a major factor there. So I think, you know, everything will be possible as it is now, you can travel to India now, but, you know, staying safe means wearing masks, washing hands, not touching your face if, if uh, possible. Uh, so should I answer that other question? Rena had two questions. One of them was for you. One of, the, one of her questions was about sharing the slides if you're comfortable with that. And if you are, um, then I can do a pass through. She can email me and I can share it that way. But you can let us know later about that. Sure. Um, but Rena, in the meantime, if you want, you could email me at levi at sosaz.org. That's L-E-V-I at sosaz.org. Um, and then if it is available to be shared, I will... Uh, pass it through to you. To answer the other question, which was she has an Orthodox friend that said some of the testing that they're doing is using genetics of non-kosher animals. Can a Jewish person benefit from that? So the short answer to this is the prohibition in the Torah about kosher is only for consumption by the mouth. So if I'm smearing pig fat or lard on my hand, I'm not eating non-kosher foods. So there really is nothing wrong with having any, I'm going to say any of these uh, different tests that are, whether it's a vaccination or uh, in the sense of where it doesn't go through the mouth. Now, let's say it goes through the mouth. It's a very simple answer as well. The Torah says you should live by these commandments, not die by these commandments. Uh, and therefore, you'd for sure be allowed to use it because this is clearly a case of life and death. 
So that's the short answer to that question. I see some more questions in the uh, chat for you. The best way a fabric, oh, what's the best way to make a fabric hat safe to wear when it's washed? I think it's the same answer as the mask. Um, it's always a good idea to wash anything that's going on or around your face. Um, you know, I have uh, masks that I sort of cycle through and let them sit um, because we know that the virus can only survive for so long before it decomposes on its own. I think uh, the approach you took of having them sit in the sun for seven days is seems good. I mean, I don't have any data on it. I can't, I can't give you any specific response, but um, certainly we know that the virus can't survive in the heat for days. Um, so I think it'd be very unlikely without having any data. I think it'd be very unlikely. A question, many people wonder, packages from Amazon. So one of the earliest really important studies that came out is looking at how long the virus can live on different types of surface. Um, so what this lab did was they took this specific virus, not a, not a related virus, they took the actual virus that's causing the current pandemic and they took a known amount of it and they sprayed it on different surfaces, stainless steel, copper, uh, plastic, cardboard. Um, the surface which the virus survived the shortest amount of time on was cardboard. So after eight hours, they could not detect any significant amount of virus. So if you imagine packages coming from Amazon, they're certainly going to be, if they're shipped from another area, they're going to be um, for much more than eight hours. Uh, if they're being delivered, then you might think, well, maybe it got exposed during delivery. What I do, I've received some packages recently. I let them sit for a day or two without touching it. And then, you know, I, when I'm opening it, I open it carefully, throw away the packaging, wash my hands, and then handle what was inside. Um, I think that that's probably the best any of us can do. Uh, is there, even if there's trace amount, is it enough to cause damage? So that's one of the things that we still don't know is how much virus is enough to cause disease. Um, we know in, the, in a dish, uh, in the lab, we know in animals, but in humans, it's not an experiment we can do. So all we know is when a human does have it or doesn't have it. Um, for many viruses, it only needs to be a very small amount. Um, I think that, that it's just always better to have an abundance of caution. So making sure you wash your hands, uh, maybe let the package sit for a day or two. At that point, based on what we know about how long the virus lasts on cardboard, um, I think that the data says there should be very little, very, very little. And if you're washing your hands, it's even better. I'm not sure if you saw, the, did you see the question about the uh, hand sanitizer versus hand washing or if hand sanitizer is sufficient enough? I'm, oh, I'm actually posting questions right. from other places. Right. Um, so they do two, two different things. Um, hand, washing with soap and water uh, is that idea of breaking apart the virus. So you're actually uh, breaking it open so the machinery no longer fits together the way it should when it's functional. What hand sanitizer does is it effectively dehydrates the virus and that causes uh, the genetic information to do what we call uh, denature. So it can no longer function anymore. They work in different ways. Um, they both have the same effect of being uh, able to neutralize this type of virus. Um, I think, you know, hand sanitizer is absolutely better than nothing. I prefer full hand washing when I can. Um, but I always walk around with a little thing, a hand sanitizer, because it, it definitely does have a prof protective effect. I wanted to follow up on the question of touching one's face. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to scratch my head up here. Right. Does that migrate into my eyes? 
I mean, no, I would. Okay. So if you're home, if you're home and you've washed your hands and you know your space is clean, you know, obviously you have to eat, brush your teeth, you know, things like that, basic, you know, hygiene. Uh, in my home, I consider this is a, a safe and clean space. So when I've washed my hands, you know, I'll scratch my face or floss my teeth and things like that and not worry about it. It's really when you're out touching doorknobs, getting things like groceries, that's when you want to be very vigilant and on high alert about potentially touching your head. Any, um, any part of your head or face? It's, it's just a good idea because you never know, like, um, you know, we, we always have little bits of skin cells coming off and things like that. And it's close to areas where we know the virus can get in. You know, it cannot get in directly through your skin because it doesn't have those receptors. But that doesn't mean that, you know, you, you scratched your hair and the virus got on the hair and then it, you know, gets close to your eye or something like that. Like there's, there's always the weird scenario. So mm -hmm. when you're out and about, it's just always best to be on high alert. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I put another couple questions in the comments over there. One of them was, can you wash paper masks? And I'm assuming obviously if it doesn't degrade and it sort of remains in its integrity, does that work? Right. Um, so that's not a sterilization procedure that we use. I don't, I've never seen data on it. I just know that that's not something that we ever do for paper masks. Um, what we do in a laboratory environment is we consider um, for sterilizing things like that, we do a heat sterilization. It's, it's heat and steam, uh, but really the steam is what's bringing in the temperature. And so we go up to uh, 121 degrees Celsius, which I believe is um, like 220-ish degrees Fahrenheit. And we leave whatever we will want to sterilize there for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, that is now being tried for respirators, the, the masks you see in the medical clinic to, to see if that prevents um, the virus from living on that surface for that amount of time. We know that heat, that, that amount of heat will kill the virus in a very, very short period of time. Um, so I've spoken to people that suggested, oh, just put it in uh, a toaster oven at that temperature for five to 10 minutes. Obviously that's a fire risk. So I'm not gonna say to do it, um, but um, I know that I've had friends who do that and, and just pay very close attention to make sure that no rubber is melting. If there's like a rubber band that goes around it or things like that, fire risk. So I'm, I'm not saying to do it. I'm just saying that that amount of heat will kill the virus uh, in a short period of time, 10 minutes or so, 10 to 20 minutes. I just want to interject for a second because you mentioned a temperature. When you look at the laws of koshering utensils, um, so there's different types of koshering processes, but the process for using water, if it was something that became non-kosher through boiling, is you have to get it to 212. So that's really interesting that you share it's around 220 to sort of decontaminate it. I think that might actually be what it is in Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's 121 Celsius in Fahrenheit is... Oh, it's 250. Okay, it's but either way, it's up yeah. there. It's, close. it's just interesting that it's, you know, that's sort of, you got to get to the specific number up there. Right. Um, there's some more questions in the chat, so if you want to check those out. I, sure. I have a question. Can I ask you something? Um, sure. If I don't have access in India to hot water all the time, if I use cold water to wash, I mean, here I can use hot water. Will that be sufficient with a lot of soap or won't? Um, so the, the part about hand washing, that's the thing that sterilizes is the soap. Okay. So making sure that you're, and there are videos that, that, that demonstrate the proper, like washing hands that you might see, like the average person do is just sort of go like this and like this real hand washing to sterilization is, is pretty complex. And it requires a lot of sort of choreography between your fingers to make sure you're getting under nails and things like that. There are videos on YouTube demonstrating this, but the part about hand washing that is the sterilizing process is not the temperature, it's the soap. And any soap will do. Thank you. And you were unbelievably wonderful. You heard every question I ever had about almost everything. Thank you. I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you. So I see a couple more. Um, if you have allergies and have a stuffed nose and occasional cough, how do you know if you have the virus? So they have released a lot of the restrictions on testing 
If you, if you are worried you have it and it will make you feel better that you don't, go get tested. Um, in Arizona, Mayo Clinic has drive-through testing uh, facilities. Uh, I'm not sure about other areas, um, but it, there's now no longer the requirement for a doctor's note to get a test. Um, this virus can present in different ways for different people. So it's not sort of a one size fits all virus. Some people never know they had it. Some people get that stuffy nose and cough. Some people get a cough, no fever. Some people get a fever, no cough. So it just based on the symptoms alone is, is very difficult or close to impossible to say you do or don't have it. I have allergies right now. I had a terrible headache yesterday. The thought did go through my mind, maybe I have it. You know, I, I took some medicine, I slept overnight, I feel better today, I no longer worry. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things you, you have to do what makes you feel best. And if you think that you were exposed or were in a high risk scenario or worried you might have it, there's no harm in getting tested. They've made it very safe to do that now. I have a question. Um, when will herd immunity come into play or will it? Right. Right, that's a very, very good question. And unfortunately and frustratingly, there's no answer that we have because um, if you think about SARS, uh, it's almost 20 years ago now, we still don't have a vaccine for SARS. And the reason for that is it's actually very difficult to get that protective immune response. We can make immune responses, but a protective immune response is the type of response we need. And that's what I was discussing before about, you know, the 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 car boot. If you put a boot on a tire, it's the good thing. If you put a boot on any other part of the car, it's useless. So what we still don't know yet is if the immune response that humans are able to make against this virus is protective, and we don't know how long that protection will last if it exists. We think it's possible because the convalescent serum therapy that's being used right now, so patients who've recovered from the virus can donate blood, the plasma is taken from the blood and the antibodies in that plasma are used to treat active patients. And that has seemed to be working really well. So at least in the early days after recovering from the virus, it seems like there is some form of protection. But again, we don't know how long that will last. And that's important for herd immunity right. because we need to have 60 to 80% of the population have protective antibodies against it in order to have that effect. Um, and sort of the question is still in the air for that. Who, who does the research on that? There's a, a tremendous number of people looking at that right now. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if I can specifically point to a laboratory that's doing that. I don't think anyone at ASU is actively doing it. And how do they test for that? Do they need to sort of put people back in an orbit with people who are infected? Um, really, the, the way it's going to work is um, they're going to take donations of blood and then test to see if those antibodies uh, stop the virus in the lab. Okay. Because the way antibodies work, if it prevents infection in a dish, in terms of the virus actually getting in, then it's likely it will do it in a human. And so uh, the NIH and the CDC just opened a 10,000 patient voluntary clinical trial, people who want to donate blood uh, to see if they have antibodies and then to take those antibodies and test them to see if they're neutralizing. Um, so you're saying pretty... it could come out sooner rather than later, or there's no answer to that? Well, the, the antibody test exists now. Um, it's not perfect, and they're making better versions of it almost on a weekly basis. If we do achieve herd immunity, then it will probably be, if it's possible, it would probably be within the same period of time that we're looking for a vaccine, a year, 18 months sort of thing. Got you. Um, Do you there's... have to be a pay? I'm sorry. No, no, continue. I was just going to tell them there's another question on the chat. Do you have to be a patient of Mayo Clinic to get a test there? I don't believe so. I don't believe so. Um, and why does one get a test? I just had this question from my aunt uh, yesterday. So <clears throat> let's say you feel sick and you get tested and you find out that you don't have it, then great. If you like, okay, I, I bring my mom groceries, I go and I walk with her. 
If I feel sick and I find out I have it, then I won't do that for a period of time. And on top of that, I would encourage her to then go get tested to see if she has it for the same reason, because my other brothers visit her. Um, it's always good to know who has it because then we can regulate social interactions. If you find, if you find out you don't have it, then great. But you know, it's always still possible to get it. A one-time test isn't a forever test. So let's say I find out that my brother has it and I saw him. Uh, if I don't have it, then I'll still go and bring my mom groceries and go walk with her sort of thing. It's just sort of a way that we can strategize social interactions because it's not always possible for everybody to be locked in their apartment 24 hours a day. And you know, people need to get groceries and stuff like that. But if we know someone has it, we can figure out alternative strategies. Someone else will bring them food, the person will stay home. Um, and then if things start getting worse, you can be on high alert for really bad things, sudden shortness of breath, it's time to go to the hospital because I know I got tested and I have it sort of thing. Um, it's just a way that you can use to plan the, the duration of feeling bad, yeah. right? Um, yeah, it's always better to have more information. I have one question based off of something you just mentioned and something you had in your uh, PowerPoint presentation. You said that the body's immune attack, which starts attacking itself, I guess, the chitosin, was that the name for it? Cytokine. Cytokine, sorry, I had yeah. some of those in there. Um, is early intervention better for that? Yes, yes. Now that's being done right now, but in a not very effective way in the clinic. So one of the most common treatments um, that's being given to patients is steroids, corticosteroids. And the goal with that is to literally handicap the immune system and shut it down. That's not very good, in the long run because we need the immune system still to control the infection. So the idea with targeting the cytokine storm is that we leave the immune system intact so that it can still do the function that attacks the virus without causing this, you know, yelling fire in a theater response where everyone's coming in and freaking out. Um, is that why your research is so, or your test is so important? Your, your lab does something with, with that, correct? Right. So. Uh, our protein is, is pretty interesting because, uh, because it comes from a virus and viruses have such a small genome, like I mentioned before, a lot of the machinery that they make do many different things like little Swiss army knives. It's not just a one trick pony. Uh, so our protein, um, we think, we, our protein we know uh, quiets the immune response. And we think it will also prevent the virus from getting into cells because the, the type of protein the virus uses to get into the cell to turn that key is exactly the type of protein that our protein uh, stops. So we think we'll actually be able to have like a, a, a combo there that we're actually stopping two parts of the infection. Uh, and that's why we're getting such interest from federal agencies right now to try it out. So curious, just to follow up on that, why not just put that into a human being? Because you mentioned earlier, it's already safe. Right, right. So uh, it never got, it was in an FDA overseen clinical trial and it was a safe and effective trial, but it was never FDA approved. Yeah, but now I, I, I read that they do a lot of these uh, for people who are already, you know, sort of at the door of, or the precipice of this way or that way to use a right. nicer way of saying it, they're right. allowing anything. Right. So that's called emergency use protocols. Um, we still need to test it against a specific virus before they'll allow it. And that's what we're actively in talks with about. With so for you, how, how long does that take? Meaning before you get to a, an actual test? Well, it's already being tested right now in the lab against the virus. Oh, okay, um, cool. So it's, you know, the F, it's, it's all red tape. So the FDA has a pretty high bar before they allow you to put stuff in humans. Um, we hope we'll get sufficiently encouraging data that they'll be willing to do it. Um, but especially with all the confusion that happened around hydroxychloroquine, um, there's a lot of sort of, well, maybe we need to take more careful steps forward. I got you. And then you have a question over there about uh... I heard once you eat something, your stomach enzymes kill the virus. Did you see that? Right. 
so the same way our uh, stomach can break down fat, it will do the same thing for um, the fat around this virus. But if you imagine if the virus gets into your mouth and then you're breathing and particles come off of that into your trachea, then that is a way to get infected. If the virus is only limited to where it gets into your stomach, then sure, the stomach acids would destroy the virus, but there's a lot of risk there if it gets into your mouth because we breathe through our mouths and talk and things like that. So there's certainly the possibility for infection in that route. Um, so it's, it's, it's still important to have properly cooked food and that people who are preparing food wash their hands. Um, in my family, we, we made a policy of um, only eating food that we make ourselves because um, you know during this time, obviously we, we do go out other times, but when this all started, we pretty quickly uh, limited to just stuff that we make for the reason of making sure that whoever's making the food, are, their hands are clean. So what about nuking the food before you eat it? Heat, heat is really good at destroying this virus. So, you know, if you're, if you're, if you got boiling hot soup, then I think probably the virus won't stand a very good chance. Okay. So, cause I, I asked that from a personal perspective, cause we do, that's the only reason why we do the, we do a Shabbat dinner once a month. So we've, we've swapped it to takeout, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that you can microwave it. Right. Right. Heat, heat is really good at killing the virus. Um, especially if it's for a couple of minutes sort of thing. Um, and that's been proven in, in many studies, not just one. So okay. we, we sure. Yeah. Um, you had a question about, I know you mentioned earlier about the Amazon packages, but this is sort of a follow-up to that. Right. Guidelines for handling mail and the daily newspaper delivery. I do it the same. Well, daily newspaper is a tough one because I leave all my papers out for a day or two. <laughs> Any mail that I get, daily newspaper, you're always going to be a day behind. Um, I mean, if it's possible to switch to reading online or something like that. I, I think it's, you know, if it's the same rule applies all the time. If you don't touch your face, you're not kicking up stuff and it's getting into your face, you're wearing a mask or something like that, the risk is low. Um, the virus isn't going to jump from a piece of paper on its own into your eye or into your nose or something like that. It requires to be carried by your hand or by some sort of, you know, dust being broken up. Um, my personal policy is I, if I get mail, I wash my hands after I bring it in, I set it aside, I don't touch it for a day or two. Um, and I wash my hands after handling it. That's, that's probably the best I could say. Just uh, on that note though, of the newspaper, I'm assuming most of these are processes that really, other than the bag, no human being has touched for the daily mail or the outer paper right. that's thrown without a bag. I don't know how they're delivering it today, but. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, paper is similar to cardboard. It's not going to last for more than a couple hours, maybe six to eight hours. Uh, I, I read that uh, in, in just one study that compared paper. Um, the big study that, that is very, very good was looking at cardboard, but paper is a similar timeline. So, you know, six, 10 hours. Uh, the virus can't survive on it. Awesome. Uh, any last questions? I know that uh, we addressed that. Uh, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. go yes. for it. It's, it's Hannah, yes. Uh, what do you think about putting a mask into the microwave and perhaps even putting it into a plastic bag and heat mm -hmm. it up real well? Might that be safer than putting mm -hmm. it into a toaster oven? Because right. the microwave is easier to clean and would right. it kill the virus? Would right. be, would be Paper would cause a fire. Right. So mm -hmm. the thing about microwaves is they're not very good at heating up things that don't have some sort of fluid in them or fluid content. So if you took like a dry piece of paper and put it in a microwave, the paper won't get very hot. So um, putting just the, you know, paper mask in a microwave may not heat it at all and probably wouldn't heat it sufficiently. Um, and if it were wet enough to get hot, then it probably would have some sort of integrity problem or I, I, I we don't microwave sterilize in the lab, for example, for the same okay. reason. All yeah. right. Thank you. Good yeah. to know. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right. Any last questions? I have one. I, I guess I'm just trying to clarify some more. You remind um, me of me in seminars. I'm always asking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so if I'm walking with this person I mentioned, mm -hmm. just the air that they breathe or that 
that gets sent my way because of their talking mm -hmm. could have the virus and could affect me. That's why I need, we both need to wear yeah. masks. If they have, if they are carriers of the virus, right? So it doesn't come out, it doesn't come from nowhere. They'd have to have been exposed at some point. Um, but carriers of the virus, you know, even if we're not actively spitting when we're talking, we are producing some aerosols mm -hmm. that can carry the virus. Um, they detected it, for example, in the air in the hallways outside of ICUs mm -hmm. in the hospital. You know, it can, it, can, it can travel short distances just by vapors that are caused by talking, coughing, sneezing. Um, that's going to be one of the big risk factors when gyms open up, for example, because people are going to be respiring heavily and sweating and things like that. And there'll be a lot of sort of aerosols in the air, as gross as it sounds. Um, but that is the thought behind keeping that six distance rule. If you're six foot, six foot. with another neighbor, I will sit six feet apart from her. Mm -hmm. do, I, do you think we should both still wear masks for that? Or because we're definitely six feet apart, we're all right. Right. So um, it's all risk factors. If you know you're both fine, if you've been in isolation for two weeks and haven't been exposed or in a risk scenario or something like that, um, you know, you may feel safer not wearing a mask. Um, it's, it's, it's all calculated risk. So if you consider your own unique scenarios and the fact that the, uh, beyond six feet, it's very unlikely for just aerosols that are generated from speaking to cause infection, then that, that's got to be part of your equation. Okay. And then I'm supposed to go to the dentist. How, you know, right. how do you think about that? I just, so Doug Ducey yesterday said, I think um, by the 15th or something along those lines, they're going to start allowing dentists to open up again, in addition to the elective procedures and happening. And in my head, I was going through that same math, what's going to happen, right? Um, I, that'll be an interesting situation. I, I'm, I'm curious what will happen. Certainly everyone will have to wear, everyone in the dentist clinic will have to wear masks, I'm sure. They Which should already. They I already do. Yeah, exactly. Um, what was that, Rabbi? They already wear masks. They, exactly, they already should. Um, really then the risk is probably theirs that they're taking, right? But you don't know if the person that saw them the day before had it, maybe expose someone and so on. So yeah. I think that they're probably going to have to start instilling some pretty rigorous um, safety protocols. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we won't know what happens until it happens, really. Um, it's going to be, we're, we're learning on the fly. We've never had this situation before. How does one go from, yes, I'll go to the grocery store once every two weeks to in my my in my mind, thinking about going to a dentist or even I have to have an MRI and go get blood work. Right. How does one do that? I just think I, I don't want to. I this, I understandably there will be a lot of hesitation as we try to get back to normality. I think amongst like the medical um, care, dentists are probably going to be among the highest risk. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, going to get an MRI, it's possible for everybody to be safely protected and covered with masks and things like that, and primary care clinics and stuff like that as well. Um, but you don't know if they had it before, the person they, the patient before. And, and that's where we can start, you know, making sure that we're washing our hands, we're not touching our faces. Doctors will have to start really being vigilant about washing their hands or wearing gloves when interacting with patients. Um, I have a friend who's a dermatologist and he's already drafting new procedures for his clinic because, you know, a lot of times dermatologists touch lesions with their bare hands and not with masks so they can feel it more carefully. Mm -hmm. And so they have new procedures for um, vigorous washing followed by secondary sterilization with hand sanitizer and stuff like that. I think, you know, at some point we have to um, trust the profession and the medical doctors are going to be the ones that um, will probably understand more than most the risk that will will happen in their practice. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's not a perfect answer. I, I have the same hesitation. You know, it's, yeah. um, it's going to be weird. I go to a lot of, you know, concerts 
-hmm. And I don't know when the next time I'll ever go to a concert is because mm -hmm. you know being in a crowded space with another 30,000 people is a pretty scary thought right now. Mm -hmm. Would you go to the dentist? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would because I would trust that they would be, that they would have my safety in mind to make sure that they are protected enough. You know, um, I suspect there will be new procedures about gowning up and changing gowns between patients and that they will only allow one patient in during a time period and things like that. You know, we, there are other things happening in terms of medical care beyond just the coronavirus. You know, there are patients that are suffering from other conditions right now. Okay. So we, we definitely can't um, abandon the rest of our healthcare completely. So um, we still gotta stay safe. You know, dental hygiene is important for more than just dental hygiene. It's also important for cardiovascular health and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I, I don't know when my next dentist appointment is. Uh, I hope it's not in the next two days. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Do you think the dentist should uh, take the temperature of a of a patient right. before right. treating a, a patient, for example, to make sure? Right. I think that that is um, that, that that's the interesting thing about taking temperatures. If a patient is already displaying a temperature, that means they've already had it for some time, yeah. right? Um, because we know there's this incubation period of two to 14 days, in some cases, three weeks, having a temperature, um, if they had the virus, it means they actually have had the virus for quite some time. Um, I think doing a temperature screen in a situation like um, a dentist, where it's you haven't seen the dentist the day before and you're just coming in right now, I think a temperature screen is a good idea. In businesses where I see people getting their temperature taken before going to work, I sort of laugh to myself or cry that, well, they were at work yesterday and they only have a temperature today. That means that they had it yesterday. So I think that there are scenarios where temperature screening, like in the case of a dentist, is, is probably going to be part of their safety protocols. I don't think doing temperature screens is the final answer to keeping everybody safe, though. Um, but I think in certain scenarios, you're right, a temperature screen would be a good idea in a dentist's office. Yeah, because someone can, can go to the dentist for an emergency because it happens today. So right, they go right. today. Right. So, so and then some of that risk will be taken on by dentists as well. So um, there may be special clinics for patients that are high risk or potentially have COVID for that sort of thing. Like I said, we, the medical profession won't abandon their patients um, they, they will find a solution of some sort because it, it would be a shame out of fear of the coronavirus for someone to suffer badly from something else. Just to jump in and then I'll, I'll do an official proper thank you though. But I, I did just see a report, maybe you read this, of some product. I think it was in either South Korea or Hong Kong or one of the uh, Asian countries that had something that they spray on surfaces that has been proven to keep viruses in general and bacteria is off for 90 days. Did you see that? I did not. I did I'll not. send it to you when I find it, if I find yeah. it, unless there's some bogus. But I mean, maybe that's just one of the, obviously the, the most important thing is like what you're saying is the contact. So. Right. <clears throat> yeah. It'd be, it'd be very interesting if they came up with something like that. I'm not familiar. They have things like that for bacteria. Um, and they act by physically preventing the bacteria from growing. I don't know about viruses. I don't think I've ever seen something like that. So I'll look. my first reaction is to be hesitant, but I'm a scientist. I have to take the data. So it, it'll be interesting to see what they are claiming. Um, what, I wanted to mention one more thing about masks um, because we've talked about them a lot here. Um, a test to make sure whether a mask is actually preventing things in or out is to light a match, put your mask, put your mask on first, light a match and then try to blow the mask, uh, blow the match out. If you can't blow the match out, it is sufficiently an air barrier preventing things in or out. If you can still blow that match out, that means that air can easily get in and out. And so that may be a scenario where you would double mask or something like that, but that would be the test to um, see whether you're getting sufficient blockage. 
That's actually pretty good to know. And that's I, the question. Uh, besides Mayo Clinic, how do you find out where other testing sites are? Right. There's um, actually, I'm just going to jump in. There's a, a huge testing blitz in, the, in Arizona for the next three Saturdays. Um, and you can find, I'm sure uh, that's what Dr. Yaron's getting. Uh, you can find it on the uh, Arizona Department of Health Services website. Right, azhealth.gov. I was like in the press conference yesterday. Right, azhealth.gov. They actually had a press conference today. All right, so I'm, I, you've given us so much of your time and I'm so appreciative. And uh, thank you so much. It's a tremendous amount of information and very helpful. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, knowledge, the patients to answer every question. Thank you. Thank uh, we you. We appreciate thank it. You. Wonderful. Thank, thank you for thank everything you. you're doing on the virus field. Uh, I know everyone appreciates that. So thank you. you. Go on CNN better than all our medical officials. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a big compliment. Thank you, everyone, for letting me thank you. speak with you today. Thank you.